Hi guys, Mr. Marek here. In this video, we're going to be studying work and power. Work, which we give the symbol W, is defined as the force exerted on an object times the distance that the object moves. And so we can write a real simple equation to start out with that looks something like this. Work equals force times distance. Now notice that's distance, not displacement. So the path actually matters. Um, work is only done on an object by a force when the force is parallel or anti-parallel to the direction that the object is moving. Anti-parallel means parallel but in the opposite direction. So like right is parallel to right, left is anti-parallel to right. And so we should modify our equation just a little bit and put a little parallel subscript for the force. So there's only work done when those two things are parallel to each other. If they're perpendicular, then there's no work being done. Work is a scalar quantity, which means it doesn't have a direction, but as we're going to see here in a few minutes, it can be negative. We measure work with the unit joules, and the definition of a joule is a newton times a meter. And as it turns out, work is done on an object to change its energy. And so they're measured in the same unit, then they should somehow be related to each other. So when work is done on an object, that causes a change in that object's energy. That is a real big key concept we refer to as the work energy theorem. So let's take a real simple example. Let's suppose we've got a four kilogram box that we're pulling to the right by a string that makes a 60 degree angle with the horizontal. So maybe something like that. The question is how much work is done by each of those four forces? And let's just say that that tension force is 40 newtons and that the frictional force going the opposite direction is 10 newtons. So we can figure out the work done by each force but two of these forces are perpendicular to the direction it's going. So the work done by gravity is going to be zero because gravity is perpendicular to the direction it's going. It's going to the right, gravity is going down, those directions are perpendicular. Same thing for the normal force, would do no work. Now the work done by the tension force would depend on the component that is parallel to the direction it's going. And so that dashing line or x component is the force that's important. And so to figure out the work done by tension, I would multiply that component, which is 20 newtons, by the 5 meters to get 100 joules. So only part of the tension is parallel to the direction of motion. We need to be sure to use the component that is parallel. The work done by friction, we don't have to do any components over there, but we do have to remember that since frictions go in the opposite direction, we need to give it a negative sign. So since friction's going to the left, we need to make that force negative 10 newtons, and then to the right, positive 5 meters, so that my work ends up being negative 50 joules. It's negative because the force is in the opposite direction of the movement. The next thing we might, might want to know here is how much network is done on the object. Like, what's the sum of all the works there? And so all we have to do is just add up the work done by all four forces, keeping in mind that gravity and the normal force do zero work, and we would get an answer of about 50 joules. That tells us that the energy change of this thing would be 50 joules. Since there's more positive work than negative work, and my net work comes out to be positive, then this object's going to gain energy. And so as a real simple way to kind of keep the positive and negative work zero, we're going to make us a little table of what happens to, or when is work positive and negative zero, as it pertains to the force, and as it pertains to the energy. So positive work is done when the force is in the same direction as the motion. So like tension in our previous example. Those kind of forces tend to add energy to the object. And so when positive work is done, then energy is gained. 
Negative work is done when the opposite is true. If the force is in the opposite direction as the motion, then that force is going to do negative work, kind of like friction in our previous example. In that case, energy is lost. The energy is going to go down. There's two situations in which the work done by a force can be zero. One, if there's no movement. Two, if the force is perpendicular to the movement. So in our previous example, gravity and the normal force were perpendicular to the direction of motion, and so that, those two forces did no work. Another example would be a centripetal force. If all that a force is doing is making something change direction, then it won't do any work. In that case, there won't be any change in energy. Suppose you have a force which is not constant or variable. So if you have such a force where it's changing over time, then we're going to kind of do something like we do with impulse. We're going to graph it. In this case, we're going to graph the force versus distance, and then find the area underneath it. So as a real simple example, suppose we had a force versus distance graph that looked like this. The first part, you can see that the force is changing over time. So I can't just plug into the equation because I don't have a single force to put in there. I have a changing force. And so if we figure out what that area is, that area will tell us how much work is done. I would recommend that you divide it up into simple shapes, such as rectangles and triangles, that you have a nice simple area formula for. So, let's look at a second example. Suppose that we have a 200 kilogram truck that's moving at 10 meters per second. The question is how much work is needed to speed it up to 40 meters per second over a distance of 50 meters. We have two equations we could possibly be using. We could do force times distance, or we could do work equals change in energy. Since I don't know how much force is involved here, I'm probably going to use change in energy. The next question you might ask yourself is what kind of energy is changing? Since the truck is speeding up and not changing heights, then I'm going to say that its change in energy is equal to its change in kinetic energy. And so, finding the change in kinetic energy, we would do 1 half mv squared at the 40 meters per second, and 1 half mv squared at 10 meters per second and subtract. Now because your velocities are squared, you can't just do 1 half times the change in velocity. You actually need to uh, include the fact that the velocity is being squared here. So there are things you can do to simplify the arithmetic if you want, but you don't necessarily have to do them. Just be careful about the squared part. And so you would get something like 160,000 joules minus 10,000 joules, which is 150,000 joules. So that's a lot of work done, but that's a big truck, and we're speeding it up by a lot, so there's a big change in energy. So the next question might be, what is the average force exerted on the truck? Now we can use our definition of work and solve it for force. And so if I divide the 150,000 joules by 50 meters, then that will tell me that the force needed on average was 3,000 newtons. Now again, that is an average force. It doesn't mean that the force was constant at 3,000 newtons the entire time. It could have been changing over time. The average is 3,000 newtons. Last thing to go over is the term power. We give power the symbol capital P. Make sure you draw it capital so you don't confuse it with the symbol for momentum. And power is defined as the rate of change in energy with respect to time. Keyword in there is rate. So I can write an equation for power like that, change in E over change in T. Well, since the change in energy is work, we could also write it like that. The unit that we use is the watt, and a watt is simply a joule per second, and so the unit for energy is joules over the unit for time is second. We call that, that quantity a watt.
And that's all.